Hi, everybody. So I know uh, I'm Caitlin Borgman, Executive Director of the ACLU of Montana. I know some people are still finding their seats, but I'm going to try to keep us on schedule in the interest of having as much time as possible to hear from the candidates and especially to entertain your questions at the end. Um, so again, for those of you who are just joining us now, Caitlin Borgman of the ACLU, this is kind of a new thing for us to be doing a candidate forum, um, and I hope we'll be doing more of these. I want to um, thank the law school for co-sponsoring the forum with us and Dean Kurgis for moderating and helping us to formulate questions for the forum. Um, and thanks also to ACLU staff attorney John Ellingson and development director Kyleen Marshall for helping to plan the forum and Michelle Cares for managing all of the logistics. Just a, one background note, the ACLU is a nonpartisan organization. We do not support uh, or oppose candidates for elective office. We're offering this event as an educational opportunity to allow the public to learn more about candidates running for public office, um, in particular for the Montana Supreme Court this year. Um, I will let uh, Dean Kerr just explain the procedure for the forum. Um, but first, let me introduce Dean Kurgis. Um, so Paul Kurgis joined the Alexander Blewett III Law School um, at the University of Montana as Dean and Professor of Law on July 1st of last year. He is an authority on dispute resolution. He's a trained mediator. He has done a lot of scholarship on um, topics ranging from the civil jury to arbitration to negotiation um, pedagogy. Before joining UM Law, Dean Kurgis was a professor of law at St. John's University Law School in Queens, not far from where I was at the City University of New York. Um, he founded and served as the faculty chair of the Hugh L. Carey Center for Dispute Resolution at St. John's. Um, and for his work building that program, he was awarded the Faculty Outstanding Achievement Medal by uh, St. John's University. So please welcome. Paul Kurgis. Thank you, Caitlin, and thanks to uh, the ACLU for putting together this uh, forum. This is uh, the first opportunity for the candidates for the Montana Supreme, Supreme Court to, um, to speak in public. So you're getting the, the first look at, um, at these candidates as they prepare for the upcoming election. It is a, a pleasure for us at the Blewett School of Law here at the University of Montana to have you here. Thank you very much for coming. I would like to introduce the candidates now and we'll get started with our debate and I will introduce them in alphabetical order for you. Uh, Professor Kristen Juris, a native of Conrad, Montana. Uh, Professor Juris attended the University of Montana, then received her JD from the University of Georgia School of Law. She practiced law with several private firms, primarily Church Harris, Johnson & Willis in Great Falls. In 2000, she joined the faculty here at the School of Law, where she taught full-time until 2013, and she has continued to teach for us as an adjunct professor since then. Welcome. Professor Juris. Uh, Mike McGrath is the current Chief Justice of the Montana Supreme Court, a native of Butte, Montana, and a veteran of the United States Air Force. Chief Justice McGrath graduated from the University of Montana in 1970 and received his JD from Gonzaga University School of Law in 1975. He served as Montana's Assistant Attorney General from 1976 to 1982 then as county attorney for Lewis and Clark County until he became Montana's attorney general in 2000, and he was elected to the Supreme Court in 2008. Dirk Sandifer is a judge on the 8th Judicial District Court in Great Falls and Cascade County. He's a native of Great Falls. He attended the University of Montana and received his JD from the University of Montana School of Law in 1993. Prior to his election to the district court in 2002, he served as deputy county attorney for Cascade County for eight years. Justice James Shea, an associate justice on the Montana Supreme Court, also a native of Butte, Justice Shea graduated from the University of Montana School of Law in 1991 
and practiced law in private practice until he was appointed to the Workers' Compensation Court in 2005. He was appointed to the Montana Supreme Court in 2014 by Governor Steve Bullock. Welcome to all of our candidates. Now, just an overview of our debate procedure today. We have prepared four questions for the candidates that they have seen and had a chance to prepare answers for. Each candidate will be given three minutes uh, for an opening statement and then three minutes as a response to each of the prepared questions. We will direct questions to the candidates in rotating order so that each of them has a turn to go first. At the conclusion of the prepared questions, we will have time for questions from the audience. You have strips of paper on your table. If you have questions for the candidates, please write those on the strips of paper and they will be picked up by our uh, ACLU staff. And then I will ask one question uh, to each of the candidates from the audience questions. With that, let's begin with our first prepared question. This goes to court administration. The Montana Supreme Court has general supervisory control over all other state courts, and that includes the power to write rules of, of court that are not rejected by the legislature. So we'll begin with Justice Shea. Uh, Justice Shea, please identify the greatest challenges that the Montana state court system faces and how the Montana Supreme Court can address those challenges. Well, uh, first of all, I, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And uh, specific to the question, I guess it's, it's twofold, and I expect Justice McGrath is going to talk about this as well. One is the, the overcrowding and the, the backlog that we have in our district courts. And uh, the way that uh, this is being addressed, at least within the court right now, we have the legislature passed a, uh, a commission to study essentially district reapportionment to somewhat uh, manage the workload and shift it from the busier districts to the, to the less busy districts. To a certain extent, though, if you look at the, the workload that all of the district courts across the state are facing relative to the number of judges we have, it is, there's only so much that can be accomplished with that. I mean, it's a little bit like the guy who has the, the blanket that's a foot too short, and so he cuts off the top of the blanket and sews it onto the, the bottom of it. And I mean, you're just basically kind of moving things around. So there's also, I know, a proposal to find more judges and uh, particularly to give some help to the busier districts. Within that specific uh, issue, though, one of the things that I've observed in, in the time that I've been up on the court now and, and certainly uh, is, is a problem that we see across the state is specifically with the dependent abuse and neglect cases. Um, the increase in those cases over the last several years has just been staggering, and, it, and it's heartbreaking. We have, these, we have parental termini termination cases up at the court pretty much on a weekly basis, and um, if you look at the statistics, the, here in Missoula County, for instance, there was in 2010, there was roughly 50 abuse and neglect cases, and in this past year, it was over 200. Um, Yellowstone County is seen an even larger increase. Uh, that was an increase of, I think it was uh, 143 in 2010, and it's now over 500 in the past year. Um, beyond that, you've got, uh, and, and it's not reserved to the, to the cities, though. The Ninth Judicial District, which is Ponderay, Toole, Teton, and Glacier County, went from 18 cases in 2010 to, I think it's, uh, well, it's 114 currently. Um, one of the biggest common denominator that we see with those is substance abuse. So I think one of the things that the courts have done are family treatment, uh, family treatment courts trying to address those issues. Um, that is probably, in terms of trying to get to the root of the problem, I think that's probably the, the biggest thing that the courts can do. Because what we're seeing is with, with the vast majority of these cases, it's not nearly as much that these are parents who are necessarily bad people per se. Some are, but I mean, it's basically a lot of folks who have just really fallen into an addiction. So, thank you. Thank you. Judge Sandifer. Thank you. I would concur with Justice Shea in regard to the main problem facing the Montana State Court system, and it is the 
overcrowding and congestion in the district courts. The Supreme Court is uh, more than caught up, uh, particularly over Chief Justice McGrath's tenure at the court. But the problem uh, is in the district courts, and the overwhelming per judge caseloads around the state are staggering, particularly in the so called urban districts from which one of uh, I come from, but also in some of these other more rural districts where these judges are in single judge districts where they have to travel around and essentially are riding the circuit. And there's no easy answer to this. The Judicial Redistricting Commission or committee that has come out of the last legislature will likely come up with some sort of recommendations as is their charge. But I think as a practical matter, it's highly unlikely that there's going to be political support ultimately in the legislature for any substantial redistricting. I think based upon the Supreme Court's workload study statistics, at least the last uh, set of those that I've seen, that uh, we are uh, short on the order of about 15 district judges in this state. And it's highly unlikely anytime soon that the legislature is going to be able to provide 15 district judges uh, in a timely fashion. They've uh, been pretty good with that. Uh, the, the court, I think, is going to let the chief deal with that, is going to seek more in the next session, but certainly not in the order that we need them. I would also share Justice Shea's views in regard to the particular problem of these child abuse neglect cases. Uh, one of the most hardest hit, uh, among other districts in the state, is Cascade County and Great Falls, where I practice. And uh, we have received some help, as I believe there has been some help in some of the other districts around the state, uh, through the good grace and offices of the chief, uh, temporarily with uh, resources. But it's a problem that seems to be growing and uh, is putting additional stress on the court. Thank you. Chief McGrath. Well, let me uh, begin by uh, thanking the uh, ACLU for putting this together. Uh, there are not a lot of uh, groups that uh, have a focus on the court system at all, much less the Supreme Court or the candidates for the Supreme Court. So it's, uh, I think, fair to say all of us appreciate the fact that you're uh, as a group interested in the courts and interested in, in uh, candidates for the court. Uh, let me also just thank Paul and the U of M School of Law and the U of M in general for, for hosting this event. Um, the biggest challenge we have, um, as alluded to earlier, really is breaks down to an access to justice issue. Uh, with a with crowded court system, people don't have the opportunity uh, to get into the court to get their cases heard. And it's, it's, a, it's a bigger problem than just the number of judges, frankly. Uh, all across uh, this state, certainly, and probably across the country, we have uh, people who either can't afford an attorney or they can't get an attorney to take their case. So a lot of them tend to uh, try to handle their cases themselves in the court system. They become what we call pro se litigants. Uh, and the number of people who are handling their case pro se has uh, increased exponentially, along with the increase in the caseloads generally. Uh, so that presents a, an issue for judges in terms of managing caseloads. We've done a number of things to try to assist with the access to justice problems since I've been there. We, uh, we have adopted minimum staff levels for district court judges. We have adopted limited scope representation rules so you don't have to take an entire case. You can help somebody on a limited basis. Uh, we have a court help system that exists all across the state uh, to help people fill out the appropriate forms and get their uh, cases moving through the system. But we really do have an incredible shortage of district court judges, and we will be asking the legislature for assistance. And the, and the dependent neglect cases that were discussed earlier are having a um, again, an exponential increase. Uh, Billings, Missoula, Great Falls, all of them have uh, threefold increases in just the number of cases filed since 2010. So it's, it's a dramatic impact. 
Professor Juris. I too want to thank all of you for taking time on a Saturday afternoon to come visit with us. Uh, we wish that all voters were as interested in this race as you are. I'm going to speak from the perspective, I'm not a sitting judge, but I'm a practicing attorney and I, I echo um, what the other three have said is one of the big problems is the backlog, especially in the urban cities. And certain cases, criminal cases, youth in need of care cases have priority. So for civil cases, um, the soonest now in Great Falls you can really schedule a trial is uh, next year. And it takes four months to have a hearing on various disputes. And this just affects the delivery of of justice and people are waiting and, and in disputes until their claims can be heard. And I echo the access to justice that so many attorneys or so many people cannot afford an attorney. And I encourage you to read Chief Justice McGrath's um, annual report of the judiciary to the legislature and he notes some of the prob these problems that are faced and that in dissolution cases, two-thirds of dissolution cases, at least one of the parties is not represented by counsel and that adds to the delays and I've seen the judges take special time and care to work with pro se clients and that is part of the problem. One of the ideas that I would have to help address this is to try to identify areas where we can either expedite processes without a hearing, such as we now can get a dissolution, a final decree without a hearing, what other areas such as certain probate matters, really can we, if there's not a, much of a dispute going on, have a, a closure of the case without taking the court's time. Additionally, looking at areas where we can provide forms, mechanized forms where pro se clients, perhaps in a landlord tenant situation, go through a flow chart of ans asking and answering questions and that would then generate a petition or an answer. Forms are available now to pro se litigants in dissolution cases, but they're not mechanized where you kind of go through a flow chart. And that may be one area, and I'm sure that there are others, that we can help people who can't afford an attorney uh, have better documentation and help them get through the process better. Thank you. We'll uh, move on now to a question about uh, judicial philosophy. With the recent passing of Supreme Court Justice Antonin Scalia, theories of constitutional and statutory interpretation have become a topic of public debate. Judge Sandifer, we'll start with you. What principles would guide you in interpreting the Montana Constitution and state statutes? Thank you. Well, first of all, much of the public debate arises out of the federal system, which is an entirely different system from the state system. It is much more politicized uh, and, and unfortunately has become increasingly a, a partisan body as a practical matter over the years. We don't have that problem in the state system. And as far as I go in regard to constitutional and statutory constructions, it's, it's the basic one, two, threes of the practice of, of law. It's, we look first and foremost to the plain meaning of the express language of the Constitution, the applicable statutes. If the plain language is vague and ambiguous, to any regard, in any regard, the next task is to discern the intent from the framers or of the legislature, as the case may be, from uh, the express language and also from the available constitutional convention materials, legislative history materials. And the, the main issue is, is that, in my view, is that when we are unable to do that, there are just certain uh, issues that need to be addressed and have not been addressed by the legislature and the court cannot solve every single problem that comes before the court and we need to be careful to police the line between determining public policy from the bench and applying which is inappropriate in my view and uh, what is appropriate which is to apply and extend existing constitutional and statutory principles to the myriad factual scenarios that come before, in the first instance, the trial courts and then the Supreme Court. Uh, Chief Justice McGrath. The, if you think about it, the, the judiciary really is the a linchpin of, of a strong democratic society. You need to have a way to resolve disputes 
that is based on the rule of law and it is uh, a system where people believe that they're going to get a fair shake. Uh, because no matter what the outcome is, if, if somebody loses a case but they still believe that the system wasn't rigged, that the system uh, was, was uh, based on fairness and the rule of law, then they'll support that system and they'll support that government. So philosophically, I think one of the, the absolute keys, uh, particularly uh, as Chief Justice, is to uh, conduct ourselves in such a manner that people know that they're going to be treated fairly, that people understand uh, that we are a court that bases its decisions on the rule of law and that uh, people will have the opportunity to be uh, present their case and have a fair shake at getting a decision that's based on that rule of law. Uh, that's how we can assure that people will continue to believe in the system and that they will continue to support uh, this, the system of government that we have. I mean, if you think about, say, an issue related to economic development, the reason the courts are so critical is because we have a way to resolve disputes in a peaceful, civilized manner. You look around the rest of the world in many places, they don't have what we have. One of the reasons that we have such a uh, thriving economy and such a thriving country is because we have a way to resolve disputes. People appreciate the system that we have and are willing to accept decisions that are made that way. And it does trouble me about what is happening on the federal level, particularly at the U.S. Supreme Court, because I think some of the things that are happening now undermine that uh, confidence that citizens have that our system is based on the rule of law and that everybody's going to get a fair shake. Professor Juris. And I agree that the rule of law is so important and that people who come before the court uh, believe that they've been given a fair shake and that the law is being consistently and predictably applied because the citizens, in order to comply with the laws, need to understand the laws and believe that the laws are going to be applied to them in the same way that they've been applied to similar facts in the future. Uh, just some additional thoughts. Uh, the, the courts do not give advisory opinions. Courts are always required to interpret and apply laws to a particular case or a particular controversy. And a part of that policy as well is the doctrine of stare decisis, uh, we, th which means that the courts generally apply prior precedent. They stay in alignment with prior interpretations of the law, prior cases, unless, of course, the law has changed or the legislature has adopted um, a new law. We in the United States ha are one of the few nations in the world that also has a common law system. Whereas in France, they rely solely upon the statutes. We have adopted the English common law back at a time when there wasn't a parliament. It was the courts, including the ecclesiastical courts, that created the laws, but it wasn't out of clean cloth. It was based upon the customs of the people. So as justices, we also, in addition to looking at statutes, take into account the common law that has developed um, in England and applies in the United States and in Montana. And in Montana, in the 1895, uh, the legislature tried to codify a lot of the common law in what is referred to as the field code. So we apply consistently not only statutes, but as well we take into account prior decisions and this interesting area of common law and apply that to the cases as well. Just a shame. Well, my wife's going to roll her eyes because she hates when I use sports metaphors, but a, a judge's job is just to call balls and strikes. And we don't get to change the strike zone based on who's at bat. And it's beyond just the principles that I would like to follow. They're codified. I mean, Title I, Section 2 of the Montana Code annotated. You know, the office of a judge is to uh, ascertain and declare what is in terms declared therein, and we don't get to insert what's been omitted from the statute or to omit what's been inserted. 
And then uh, just as uh, Judge Sandifer said, if there is an ambiguity or if it's unclear, then we can look to the legislative history or we can look to the constitutional uh, history of a particular to try and discern the, the intent of either the framers of the Constitution or of the legislature. And that's our, that's our function, is to do that. It's not to, as I think, just to reiterate what everyone else has, has basically said, is not to uh, try and be a policy body. That's the legislature's job and the executive's job. And our job is, I'm a big believer in staying in my own lane and uh, just doing ex what I took an oath to do and doing what I'm getting paid to do, which is to call balls and strikes. Our Constitution calls for the election of judges, and of course we are uh, at the beginning of, of a campaign here, and the Constitution also prohibits judicial candidates from seeking, accepting, or using partisan or other political <laughs> endorsements. Would you prefer, and I'll start with you, Chief Justice McGrath, would you prefer to have Montana Supreme Court justices appointed rather than elected? Uh, no. Uh, I have been an advocate uh, basically my entire career for uh, elected judges. Uh, I will confess that uh, events of the last few years, given the Citizens United opinion and uh, Western tradition partnerships opinions, uh, caused me to have some pause. But I still think uh, it's very important that uh, judges remain elected officials. The fact of the matter is, uh, we're pretty isolated. We get to be very isolated, particularly where we are, but I think that's true of judges in general. Uh, and the advantage of an election process is it forces uh, those of us that tend to live in this uh, uh, isolated atmosphere to get out, to become part of your community, to be aware of the community, to hear what uh, people uh, are thinking or what's happening in their community. I think it uh, makes individual judges better informed and uh, aware, if you will, of uh, what it is that's going on around them. And so I think the isolation is a, is a, is a problem that elections take care of. Uh, there's, no, there's no perfect system. I mean, uh, uh, first of all, I, I find the term merit selection offensive. I mean, merit according to who, uh, who decides merit and what, what it is. Uh, if you got an A or a B, is that merit? I mean, it's ridiculous. Uh, and there's no perfect system. I mean, you are not, uh, by going to an appointed system, going to take politics out of the judiciary. Again, I'll refer to what's happening in our nation's capital right now. Uh, but there are plenty of examples of that. So there's, there's really no perfect system of judicial selection. Um, I think that there could be significant improvements to uh, the system that we have now in terms of elected officials, I think we should have certainly uh, broad disclosure. I think the new laws that have been passed appear uh, to provide for broad disclosure of who's supporting candidates and why. But that still comes right down to a tend to fall on the side of favoring elected officials. Professor Juris. Article 2, Section 1 of the Montana Constitution says that all political power is vested in and derived from the people. All government of right originates with the people. I believe that the election of judges by the people is in alignment with and more consistent with this constitutional provision than the merit system. And I agree with Chief Justice McGrath. Both systems have their advantages and both systems have their problems. And we see after the death of Justice Scalia the, some of the problems with the appointment process, which can also be highly politicized. Even in our 1889 Constitution, uh, judges were elected, and you might be interested to know that originally judges ran as Republicans and Democrats, and it wasn't until 1935 that judicial elections became nonpartisan. 
with the 1971-1972 Montana Constitutional Convention, this was one of the most highly debated topics. More than two days were spent, the longest of any other topic, discussing this. And there were two opposite proposals. One was for the election of judges consistent with the 1889 Constitution, and the other was a merit-based proposal. And finally, the uh, election of judges prevailed. Another interesting aspect aspect of the CONCON convention was that there was also discussion of a proposal to finance judicial campaigns publicly, which was defeated uh, 49 to 48 very closely uh, because of some of the concerns of judges soliciting contributions. Does that have any effect on the way judges decide cases afterwards? So that was something that was visited once, and perhaps the legislature may or may not want to visit it again, but as an improvement of the elective process is some sort of public financing of campaigns. I, too, am concerned about independent expenditures in judicial campaigns. We've, we saw a lot of it last year. That wasn't the only um, election that we did. Um, last year, the candidates raised about equally $300,000. We don't raise as much money as judicial candidates, as, as the gubernatorial candidates. And $1.3 million in independent expenditures, e very much equally split behind um, both of the justices in that case. And I don't think any of us at this table want to see that sort of activity going on in this campaign cycle. Just Shea. Well, um, I, I would echo uh, both uh, Chief Justice McGrath and uh, Professor Juris. I, I strongly support the election of judges. I would like to reserve the right to revise my remarks on November 9th, depending on how that turns out. <laughs> um, no, I'm, you know, we, we have a good appointment process, and I've been through the appointment process three times, twice when I was appointed and then reappointed as work comp judge, and then when I was appointed to the Supreme Court. And, and it's a very good process, and I think it's, it's, it's a great process for filling the vacancy. It's an extensive process. You're vetted by a commission. You're, there's public comment and all of that. But I would echo what uh, Chief Justice McGrath said, which is the, particularly for the appellate courts, when all we're seeing is uh, paper. We're, and you know, occasionally we'll see the lawyers arguing when we have oral arguments, but we're just getting the record, and we're not seeing the people whose lives are being impacted by the decisions we make. And you've still got to make decisions based on the law, not emotion, but I do think there is value to getting out there and meeting the people whose lives are being impacted by the decisions we make. Um, it's one of the things that I miss from my years on the trial court was at least I, I knew there was a face to the to the decisions that I made. Um, I would also echo though both uh, Chief Justice McGrath and Professor Juris's concerns about the outside spending and one of the particularly ironic and insidious things about electing judges when you can have these these uh, outside expenditures and you can have uh, uh, cases that are being, uh, or excuse me, ads that are being run about a particular decision is we decide several hundred cases a year. And a judge should be immune to the prevailing political winds and shouldn't be de basing a decision some, oftentimes on certainly their own uh, personal feelings. And inevitably you're going to have, and it could be an, a unanimous decision, but inevitably you're going to have decisions that are unpopular. And you're just to, to use my metaphor again, calling balls and strikes, but you know, you can, we could uphold a zoning ordinance that says a family can't own more than three dogs, and the next thing you see is uh, a commercial saying that, uh, you know, little Timmy crying into the camera that Justice Shea took away his puppy. And, you know, with his, uh, a sinister voice saying, you know, why does Jim Shea hate puppies? And I want to go on the record, <laughs> I'm pro puppy, I'm pro puppy, and I'm not afraid who knows it, but this is one of the problems with with the the elections that being said i do think that there's some real value to this i think that it does get us out of our our chambers and it does put faces as i said particularly for the appellate court it does put faces to the to the decisions that we're making judge sandifer i agree that we should maintain the system that we have for the election of judges in montana first and foremost because it was hotly debated 
in the Constitutional Convention, and that was the will of the people. And Montanans very fiercely hold on to the uh, right to select their judges, and I think that time has shown that that's been a good process. As far as the insulation or lack of insulation from political influence on judicial decisions, I don't think that that is as big a problem on the Supreme Court as it is at the district court level where uh, with respect to the justices here today in most of the communities, people, the ordinary people, meaning non-lawyers, are uh, <laughs> ill-informed Ill often, ill-informed about who the, the Supreme Court justices are, particularly when they're making a decision as a body. But when you're sitting down there as a district judge in these communities on an island by yourself and you're deciding what's going to happen in the civil case or who's going to go to prison here or there, uh, you're very close to uh, the clamor in the community and there's somewhat of an inherent conflict that you find yourself in uh, where you have to maintain your uh, legal and ethical integrity to make the hard decisions on the hard cases and disregard the public clamor. Now that's easy to say sitting in here today, but when you're sitting out there in those communities and people are passing petitions around that want to unelect you because they don't like the last decision you made, that's where the rubber meets the road with your integrity. But uh, that notwithstanding, it's still a better system and if people think, that the people that say that an appointment system will eliminate uh, politics, they're sadly mistaken. Uh, the political appointment, or excuse me, the merit appointment process is every bit as political, particularly at the federal level, uh, as an election is. And I think the election is, is uh, more forthright and straightforward because at least it's out in the open in the sunlight. The Montana selection system is better than the federal system, but there's still politics involved. And I think that the election system is the best. Thank you. And now we'll, we'll turn to distinctions between uh, the, the federal constitution and the Montana constitution. They are similar in many ways. They are different in some important ways. And our Supreme Court has um, sometimes chosen not to interpret our constitution in the same way as the federal constitution, even when the language is very similar or identical. Professor Juris, what do you consider the most important differences between the Montana Constitution and the United States Constitution, and what unique role does our Constitution play in promoting justice in Montana? Well, one of the first and most obvious uh, differences is that the Montana Constitution was drafted and adopted in 1973. And you compare that to the federal constitution, which was drafted in 1787 and 1788, and that in and of itself gives rise to numerous and significant differences. Um, and there's much more of a record of the legislative history of the CONCON convention than we're able to grasp with the uh, federal constitution. Um, I'm very proud of the Montana Constitution, as I am sure that all of you ACLU members are as well. It expressly creates and uh, reserves rights that um, the federal constitution doesn't articulate. Rights, first and foremost, are reserved to the people. All political power is vested in and derived from the people. And people may propose themselves constitutional amendments by initiative following a specific statutory procedure as well as statutory initiatives and referendum. Those are not provided in the federal constitution. Whereas the Bill of Rights in the federal constitution is uh, at the end of the constitution, the first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, Montana's constitution starts with a declaration of rights and includes rights that are not specifically mentioned in the federal constitution, including the right to a clean and healthful environment, pursuing life's basic necessities, uh, human dignity, um, there is the right to participate in government, the right to know and observe government deliberations, uh, the right of individual privacy. Uh, we have a broader right to bear arms under our articulation of the Second Amendment than the federal constitution. Interestingly, the government decided that it would not have immunity from suit for injury to person or property, unless as approved by the legislature by a two-thirds vote majority of each house. So we kind of gave up the king's privilege of being immune from suit, which was, in my opinion, 
quite earth shaking. We have specific legislative duties that don't exist at the federal level, including a balanced budget. Thank you. Um, we recognize the distinct and unique cultural heritage of American Indians and have a policy of incorporating that culture into our education. Um, we have a guarantee of equality of educational opportunity. And so it is much more specific in granting individual rights, uh, broader limitations on government than the federal government as well. I'm proud of that constitution. Justice Shea. Well, really, uh, basically all I can do is echo much of what uh, Professor Juris said. And we, obviously, we have a, a, a federal constitution that we all can be proud of. But what we had in the, with the 1972 Constitutional Convention was a constitution that, for two basic reasons, one is had the benefit of hindsight, uh, both in terms of a country that had been pursuing this experiment for 200 years and a state that had been pursuing it for over 80. And so they were able to incorporate and, and address the unique challenges and, and the unique values that we face in Montana. And among the ones that, as Professor Juris alluded to, there are a number of rights in Article 2 that are enumerated, many of, many of the same rights that are parroted in the, or essentially substantively the same as in the Bill of Rights of the Federal Constitution. But we also have the rights that are expressed, the, you know, there's the right to privacy, which is implied in the Federal Constitution, is expressly provided for in the Montana Constitution. Uh, Article 2, Section 3 sets forth the inalienable rights that, uh, that we're, we're entitled to, such as the right to a clean and healthful environment and the right to pursue life's basic necessities. And there are others in terms of the, the right of the people to participate, the right of the people to know, uh, as I said, the express right of privacy. I think it's also reflected in Article 9 of, of our Constitution in terms of uh, managing our environment and our natural resources. And Article 10, the express rights to a, public, a quality public education. Um, these are things that, as I said, I think the framers of our Constitution in, in 1972 had the benefit of both the, the hindsight and seeing what's worked and didn't work over the, over the the previous 200 years, as well as looking at what were the problems we had to address and specifically embodying our values. Uh, it was a constitution that was drafted by Montanans for Montanans, and I think we've, uh, we've reaped the benefits of that. So. Judge Sandifer. I think as a threshold matter, people need to understand and, and keep in mind that both of these documents, although they have a lot of similarities, were drafted for fundamentally different purposes. The federal constitution drafted to provide a national government over a confederation of states with a federal government at least at the beginning was supposed to be a government of limited powers notwithstanding what it has become. And the state constitution uh, drafted to address the health, welfare, safety of the citizens of the state of Montana within the broad police power and welfare power that the state has. I think the, in regard to specifically the question, uh, as noted by uh, Professor Juris and Justice Shea, there are a number of Montana specific and Montana enhanced provisions in regard to uh, individual rights in our Constitution. And uh, chiefly among them, in my view, although they're all equally important, but uh, you know, the rights to individual privacy that are is, is, is sacrosanct uh, to Montanans, and that's reflected in our Constitution. And I think of particular interest uh, as an additional uh, provision that has not been mentioned, and it is of particular interest to this organization, is that unlike the federal Constitution and, and the limitation on uh, uh, the 14th Amendment protections to government action only, the Montana Constitution uh, prohibits uh, discrimination on the basis not only, uh, or not, excuse me, not only through state action, but through private action as well. And that's a huge difference as it relates to civil rights. The Montana Constitution also uh, deals with public education and funding, protection of the environment, natural resources, all of these things are different as well. Chief Justice McGrath. Well, this is a tough question to be the last person to respond to because <laughs> I agree with what everybody said. I mean, it, uh, there are uh, some 
very significant differences, uh, some obvious differences. I think all of us are proud of the Constitution that we have. I suspect the most significant um, reason that it's somewhat different is because one was, uh, you know, there's about 190 years of history between uh, the passage, uh, ratification of the U.S. Constitution and the adoption of the Montana Constitution, and a lot of things uh, changed. A lot of things have happened. Earlier, um, the dean mentioned uh, Justice Scalia and the passage of Justice Scalia and his um, uh, impacts that he had on the court. He was, as I'm sure everybody knows, a proponent of uh, what he called the originalist theory of interpreting the U.S. Constitution. Um, obviously, you don't do that um, uh, in, in a vacuum. I mean, I, I, I think there's a re you know, the U.S. Constitution is uh, constantly being reevaluated and being reinterpreted as we as a society develop. There's a, there's a famous statement um, from uh, Justice Alito uh, during the course of an argument in 2010 in response to uh, Scalia's uh, originalist theory, and it is, I think what Justice Scalia wants to know is what James Madison thought about video games. <laughs> uh, obviously, it's a different world. I mean, it's, I'm not sure I could phrase it any better than that. Uh, I think there's a reason that uh, the originalist theory uh, has not uh, gained much traction even on the U.S. Supreme Court by uh, justices uh, like Alito who may be uh, aligned with Justice Scalia in a lot of cases. Uh, and it's because the world is a different place. Uh, we don't have that situation necessarily with the Montana Constitution because uh, the framers of, of our Constitution had that almost 200 years of history to uh, uh, incorporate into their provisions. Thank you. So we will um, we'll, we'll take a moment now to collect audience questions. And, and while we do that and we organize those, we'll give the candidates a chance uh, to give us their, uh, their summary statements that they have uh, prepared. So uh, Justice Shea, go ahead. Well, I, I just uh, appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. I think that uh, it is as uh, the, one of the uh, others up here had, had alluded to, I think it is it's in, critically important uh, to become engaged in these cases in, in these races. Uh, these are these are important races, obviously, and I think that I appreciate everybody coming out on a on a Saturday afternoon uh, to to hear us speak. Uh, when we came when we were coming over the bridge, my my wife was uh, noting the the. Fieldhouse parking lot was full, and she said, "What do you think's going on?" And I said, "Well, clearly they're all here for us." Um, and and I think, uh, as I think uh, Professor Juris alluded to, it's 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 important because, as 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 I've said before, uh, I harbor no illusions, much as my ego would like me to believe otherwise, that you could put all seven members of the Montana Supreme Court in a lineup with Judge Judy and ask a random sample to identify the judge. And I guarantee none of us are going to be picked out of that lineup. And yet, we are, we're passing judgment on important cases. And it's why I think it's important for us to get out and to be, as I said before, to put a face to the decisions that we make and to get feedback uh, for better or worse. And sometimes the for worse uh, feedback is some of the most useful. But I think it's important, and I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here, and I appreciate uh, all of you being here, and uh, the the questions that have been posed by the dean, and uh, just the, this just the chance to to have this engagement. Thank you. I would echo that. Thanks for your attention and and the interest in the court. It's uncommon, unfortunately, these days, and so it's greatly appreciated by all. In regard to uh, my race in this, uh, this cycle, I'm running for the court because I think it's imperative in the face of the increasing politicization of the court over these last several cycles to maintain the integrity of the court 
and I want to help maintain the integrity of a court of the court as the only branch of Montana government where all Montanans can come to the court and have a fair and even playing field under the rule of law without regard for race, religion, gender, personal preference, socioeconomic status, or other classifications that uh, have no business being the basis of decisions under our system of constitutional law. As a district judge in this state in one, one of Montana's busiest judicial districts, I have 14 years of experience of handling the most complex and important cases that come before Montana's courts. I have a record that I'm proud of. I have a reputation around this state with the practicing lawyers as a fair, impartial, and highly competent judge. And there's no question about what I will do on the court. All you need to do is look at the record that I have over the past 14 years, and it speaks for itself. There's been some talk, and there will continue to be some talk, about the need for a particular perspective or this perspective on the court. The court is no place for perspectives. The court is not a legislative, or a red, excuse me, a representative body like the legislature. The court needs to be a place where we're deciding cases based on the law and the facts without regard for perspective. That's why the lady justice wears a blindfold, because justice is supposed to be blind except in regard to the applicable facts in law. So thank you for your attention and the opportunity to be here today. I greatly appreciate it. Chief Justice McGrath. Um, I consider myself to be a lucky person and very privileged to have the opportunity to serve as uh, Chief Justice on the Montana Supreme Court. Uh, I enjoy the position. I enjoy uh, working with my colleagues, and uh, I hope to have an opportunity to serve a second eight-year term. Um, I'm proud of the accomplishments that we've made uh, over the last few years, particularly the management accomplishments we've made. Um, eight years ago, I spoke to a group similar to this and talked a lot about uh, the, the backlog that uh, we had at the Montana Supreme Court, the fact that we had uh, a significant number of cases, almost 100 cases that were over a year old uh, from the time the case got to the court until it was decided. Uh, we're now uh, down to uh, turning our cases around within, uh, within 100 days. I'd venture to say maybe we have one case that's uh, exceeding that 100-day time limit right now. I think also I'm proud of the fact that our decisions tend to be uh, more concise, uh, I think, more precisely written, more limited to the law and the facts of the case that we have. Uh, and I think that that's been recognized by uh, those that practice before the courts or those that uh, have a tendency to follow our opinions. In a uh, survey that was done uh, through the National Center for State Courts uh, near the end of 2014, 95% uh, of the judges, the district judges in this state, thought that the Montana Supreme Court based its opinions on facts and the law of the case. Uh, the, the survey was conducted of all the lawyers that have practiced before the court as well as faculty members and judges. 80, over, uh, I think it was 85% of the respondents said that they felt that the court was doing a good job. Uh, I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the fact that uh, uh, we have become or are becoming a respected institution. Uh, we, we have credibility in the legislature because of that. They tend to uh, listen to the, the, the requests that we make and tend to give us uh, at least a chance at uh, dealing with some of the problems that we have in terms of crowding. Uh, so I'm looking forward to the opportunity of serving another term. Thank you. Professor Juris. I'm running for the Montana Supreme Court because I believe that a diverse court, a court with a variety of backgrounds and experiences is better as a whole and then better serves the parties that appear 
before it. My background has been in representing individuals, small business owners, uh, agricultural producers for more than 30 years. Unfortunately, the law has become so very complex today, just like the medical profession. You wouldn't go to a podiatrist if you were suffering from cancer. Uh, medicine has become specialized. The law has become specialized. And in my opinion, I don't believe on the court right now um, there's a person with the experience that I have, with the specialization that I have in you know, not representing the government, but in representing individuals, small business owners, egg producers, in the daily legal battles that they face. For example, we've only seen the tip of the iceberg in water rights claims. Now that we have our final compact approved, only uh, six of 85 basins are currently adjudicated. We're going to see more and more water rights claims rise up. And I have filed water rights claims. I've actually irrigated my dad's hay fields, uh, litigated water rights claims. And I think just that background and perspective just brings a better overall view to the court. There's areas where I don't have expertise, such as criminal law. And I think it's important that there is on the court somebody with extensive criminal law procedures. And I think there are already prosecutors and pu former public defenders. I think it's important to have on the court, and we already do have a district court judge and administrative law judge that are specialists in procedures in those sorts of areas. But I generally believe that it would benefit the court um, to have the experience of somebody who's been in the trenches facing those uh, contracts claims, property resolutions, probate, taxation, property tax issues on a daily basis for more than 30 years. Great, thanks. And now I'll, I'll ask uh, the candidates um, some questions from the audience. And I'll begin with you, Chief McGrath. Uh, we have a couple of questions that that get to uh, one of the, the points that you alluded to, which is um, the, the process of appeals, the number of appeals. Um, are appeals to the Supreme Court too frequent? And would there be a reason to consider adding a, a, an intermediate appellate court? Uh, short answer is no and no. Uh, we handle about, uh, in terms of direct appeals, anywhere from 350 to 400 cases a year. Uh, and then we have a similar number of writs or original proceedings. But we're able to stay on top of our caseload. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we, we turn cases around in less than 100 days. Uh, the, the thing about Montana and the appeal process is everybody has a right to appeal. We don't have an intermediate appellate court. So we get a number of cases that uh, tend to be what what I might consider to be court of appeals cases. So one of the changes that we've made in terms of trying to make our system more efficient is that we do tend to issue uh, more memorandum opinions. Uh, those are opinions that uh, tend to be short, concise, uh, address the issue that's presented, but if it doesn't involve any new, you know, questions of new law or new precedent, or if it's a, a fairly straightforward statutory interpretation case, we can resolve those cases uh, much like we would as a court of appeals case. And then that gives us a little more time uh, to deal with maybe a more complicated water rights case or, or other type of case that takes a little more time to resolve. Uh, I don't see that adding an intermediate uh, court would uh, solve any backlogs. In fact, I think it would be just the opposite. It would tend to uh, create another barrier for people getting their uh, cases resolved in a uh, prompt manner. Professor Juris, I'll ask you this one. One of the, um, the points that came up earlier was the, the prevalence of abuse and neglect cases um, in the court system. Uh, one way to address those might be to expand the self-help law centers across the state, and those centers are funded by the Supreme Court. Would expansion of those centers be something you would favor? Absolutely. I favor the expansion of self-help 
clinics, and rather than spend money on an intermediate court, which would be quite expensive, I wish the legislature would spend more money on uh, legal services sorts of clinics for people who otherwise don't have access to justice. Um, with regard to whether those clinics are going to help with regard to youth in need of care cases, uh, those cases are so often tied to substance abuse that I don't know that improve that self-help clinics is real that's one of the areas of law that self-help clinics would really have much of an impact on uh, could I, if I could just very quickly yeah, go ahead. jump in on that um, the legislature last session created a, um, a pilot project for trying some mediation efforts with dependent neglect cases and trying to resolve cases at the front end uh, we have uh, hired a director of that. We've done a lot of training. We have done, we've got a system in place ready to go. And to date, we have zero referrals. Uh, there's just, uh, I just don't think it's feasible to think that we can mediate uh, a dependent neglect case after the case is filed or after the children have been removed. Uh, it has to be done in a much quicker, uh, less formal system not involving the court system at all and uh, the the executive branch not to take everybody's time but the the government uh the governor has requested uh, or reassigned 35 positions within the department of health and human services to assist with social workers in trying to deal with some of these uh, at-risk kids and problems early on in the system and, and i think that's going to be much more effective than the uh, apparent failed mediation efforts that we've been trying to do the last year. Can, can I add one thing to that, please? Go ahead. Yeah. Very briefly, the self-help clinics are not, in expansion of that, is not going to help uh, underrepresented people in the abuse-neglect arena. There are not unrepresented people in the abuse-neglect arena because these cases involve fundamental parental rights. Uh, these people have a court-appointed uh, court counsel in, in these cases, so these people are represented. It's pr maybe uh, in addition to the criminal area, in, in, at least on the felony side, one of the few areas of law where we don't have a uh, self-represented or underrepresented uh, client population or problem. Uh, <clears throat> Judge Sanford, you, you mentioned um, one of the distinctive features of our Constitution um, is the, the fact that the Constitution itself uh, prohibits discrimination um, uh, among individuals, not just on the part of the government. Um, does that create a special tension in Montana uh, between First Amendment rights, rights of freedom of religion, freedom of speech, and, uh, and the, the obligation to avoid uh, discrimination. And obviously, I wouldn't want you to comment on any cases that might or, or, or are before you. But in general terms, um, is that an area where there is a special tension in the, between um, the, the Montana courts and the federal constitution? Well, to be frank about that, I think it presents an area where there are people and forces around the country, not only in Montana, but elsewhere, who are trying to create that tension. But the tension there, largely, that's developing in other places, not so much here yet, but it may yet come here, is this tension that is increasing between the uh, fundamental right uh, to freely exercise your religious beliefs and how far that goes in relation to the ability to discriminate against others in the exercise of their constitutional and statutory civil rights. And uh, beyond that, as far as being more particular, it's difficult for me to comment other than to say that the current state of the federal and the state law uh, does not provide for uh, the ability under the free exercise clause to discriminate against other individuals in the exercise of their legally protected civil rights. And I would give any other candidates a chance if anyone else wants to respond to that question since we have done that. Uh, Justice Shea, um, 
How would increased resources for the public defender's offices affect the, the courts of the state? Um, would, is, is that a, a potential way to help deal with some of the access to justice issues? Would it have an effect on, on court congestion in your mind? Well, I, I, I think uh, the, the short answer on that is it depends. I, I think, it's, I think there's, there's, it's a multifaceted problem. <laughs> And I think what we've seen certainly at the appellate level is there are, and I can't remember, I think probably Chief Justice McGrath has the specific figure off the, the top of his head, but we have seen considerable delays in, in terms of the appeals. And I know it, that in that instance, it is largely a function of a shortage of manpower in terms of trying to handle these appeals. I mean, we're routinely seeing uh, requests for extension after extension after extension, and it's, uh, you know, I was a public defender myself in Portland, and you know, I mean, it's, it's something that, when it's, it's valuable experience, and it was, I tried a ton of cases, but when you're looking, starting every week with, literally a dozen or more cases set for trial, it's, it is really difficult to have a have a to give what is a constitutional representation to to everybody and so it is it, it is definitely a concern now there are others and i know that uh and i am not privy to the budgeting process and i'm not privy to the the resources and how they're used i know there have been some some discussions in terms of how uh could it, could it be the resources be better managed or what have you well i'm sure that's true of any agency um but i do think that there is a an issue in terms of the constitutionality, and I know obviously where we're seeing it most is because we're an appellate court, is in the office of the appellate defender, where it is, and it is particularly concerning because you're talking about somebody's liberty. And so when you're seeing a case come up that, that has been uh, delayed for several months, and we certainly are getting to them and resolving them as the Chief Justice alluded to in a timely fashion, deciding cases within 100 days. But it's, it's something I don't think it is as easy as a solution as just throwing money at it, because I think there are more issues at play there. But I do think that's certainly one of the, one of the many factors that go into it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, again, I would give any other candidates a chance to speak on the issue. Well, just to clarify uh, what we're talking about in delay now, and we, we see this uh, fairly common now over the last couple of years, is that uh, the, the cases don't get briefed in a timely fashion uh, very often. It is not at all unusual that we, that I entertain extensions for, uh, requests for extensions for a 12th and 13th time. Uh, it's, it's taking sometimes the appellate defender's office a year and a half or more uh, to file their initial brief. So obviously they've got some resource issues there that need to be addressed. And uh, we, we have, uh, myself and the court administrator's office has worked with the Office of Public Defender uh, to try to assist them at uh, increasing their budget and at the same time making their system uh, their organizational system, management system, a little more efficient. Um, I'm hoping that uh, they will be successful in creating an office manager similar to what we have at the courts uh, as a court administrator who is not an attorney, is not a judge, but is somebody who can uh, deal with the management decisions and personnel issues and things like that that are essential. They don't demand it. The, the court administrator uh, has nothing to do with deciding cases. The administrator that I think we should have in the public defender's office would have nothing to do with the managing cases or deciding how cases are handled or what case uh, or what position the lawyers take, but nevertheless deal with the, the many management issues that come up that take the time of the director right now. So I think they could do that, but they clearly need some assistance in terms of funding, both at the appellate level and the trial level. Professor Juris, one of the constitutional provisions you mentioned that distinguishes the Montana Constitution is the, um, the provision for a, a clean and healthful environment. Um, and again, without getting into any cases that, that might be before you, in general terms, 
how does that constitutional provision create different responsibilities as a, as a judge than might exist in a state that didn't have such a provision? The right to a clean and healthful environment is mentioned twice in the Montana Constitution. First, um, it's one of the inalienable rights. And then it's mentioned again in Article 9 in that it requires the legislature to provide for the enforcement of the duty to provide clean and health, uh, clean and healthful environment. It also requires the legislature to protect the environment from degradation. And we have seen cases, and there will be, I'm certain, in the future, this is going to be one of the provisions that will come up again before the court because all of the questions haven't been answered. Um, but to what extent does this duty actually affect um, private individuals with regard to acts on their private land? Um, to what extent does it limit an administrative agency's ability to issue permits without environmental review, degradation of waters? So I believe that this is one of the constitutional areas that is going to still require years of interpretation as this particular and unique and important right um, is addressed by the court. And any other judges wish to, or candidates wish to speak on that? Oh, I have one other comment to add. Please. When it's addressed in Article 2, the inalienable rights are under a strict scrutiny, a higher standard of review by the courts, where um, legislative action affecting that is under strict scrutiny and has to be served by a compelling state interest in order to withstand a violation of that right. Under Article 9, it's not a strict scrutiny standard. It's a lower standard of uh, judicial review that validates or invalidates actions taken under Article 9. Okay, great. And now uh, for our, our last question, I'll, I'll ask of all the candidates, and since we started our, our prepared statements uh, on this end, we'll start on the other end. So, uh, Professor Juris, the, the question's a very simple one, and this was asked by a member of the audience. Why should I vote for you? I believe in diversity. For example, I have a son that's a Grizz, a son that's a Bobcat, and a son that's an ore digger. <laughs> now, you should vote for me because I would bring to the court what, in my opinion, a, a depth of expertise in certain areas that is currently missing from the court and that would truly benefit the court in its analysis, um, having that viewpoint, and make it a better court and better for the people who appear. Uh, just to, to reiterate what uh, I mentioned earlier, I think that uh, we have a record that uh, the court can look at in recent years that uh, the people of Montana can be proud of. Uh, I certainly am proud of the things that we've accomplished, not only administratively, but uh, in terms of our uh, legal opinions and uh, uh, the way those are issued and how they're issued. Uh, I, I think it's critical, as I said early, that uh, people have confidence in the judiciary, that have confidence that there is a way to resolve disputes uh, that is based on the rule of law and that everybody will be given a fair uh, chance to present their case, and I'm committed to doing that in the future. Why should you vote for me? You should vote for me because I'm uniquely qualified in my race to serve on the court. I'm the only candidate in this race with respect, sincere respect to Professor Juris, who has a record of actually deciding the full panoply, the full spectrum of cases that come before Montana's district and Supreme Courts. I have a record that's well known around the state to the people that uh, are in the court the most, that is the lawyers. Ask lawyers that you know in your communities of, of whatever stripe, whether they're plaintiffs, civil lawyers, whether they're civil defense lawyers, whether they're criminal prosecutors, whether they're defense lawyers, whether they're government lawyers, you ask them, they'll tell you that I'm a straight shooter, I'm fair, I'm impartial, I'm highly competent, and decisions are decided based solely on the facts and the law without considerations of other interests or concerns. 
I've uh, been through, the, as I said, the, the appointment process here. This is the first time I'll be on the ballot, but it's, I've been through the appointment process three times and uh, have gone through an extensive screening process. And during, I've been a judge now for 10 and a half years. Uh, I'm closing in on two years on the Supreme Court. I was on the work comp court for eight and a half years. And there were several vacancies that came up during my tenure on the work comp court. There were four before I finally put my name in to, to be on the Supreme Court. And each time, somebody would talk to me about whether I was interested and I deferred until this most recent time in 2014. And one of the things that I am really genuinely proud of and I think speaks to my reputation as a judge, uh, both in my tenure on the work comp court for the eight and a half years or a little more than that in my time on the Supreme Court is as uh, similar to what uh, Judge Sandifer alluded to as I had I, from attorneys from across the state on both sides, uh, encouraged me and sought and, and asked me to put my name in for this position. Uh, when they had the public comment period for the position that I'm currently holding, when I was appointed to the Supreme Court, I had, uh, there were 100 plus letters of people who wrote in support of my appointment to the court. And uh, I had a judge, uh, district judge friend of mine comment that there were some lawyers who he couldn't get to agree what time the sun came up this morning, who had both written letters in support of me. They were civil defense attorneys, criminal defense attorneys, prosecutors, uh, law enforcement. Uh, and uh, there was, I think I may have had one of the few distinctions of uh, anybody who's put in who I had a sitting board member for the AFL-CIO and a sitting board member for the Montana Chamber of Commerce who wrote letters encouraging the governor to appoint me to the Supreme Court. So. As I have said uh, repeatedly, it is another one of those situations where I think you can look at the record, look at the people who are supporting me across the sp state, across the spectrum. Uh, you don't have to guess what kind of a judge I'll be because you can see what kind of a judge I've been. Well, that concludes our forum. Let's, let's thank our candidates for their thoughtful <laughs> comments. And so on, on behalf of the, uh, the Alexander Blewett Third School of Law here at the University of Montana, I want to again thank the ACLU for putting this program together. I want to thank you all for attending, and I want to encourage you to vote. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Seven, uh, <laughs> and ten. Cruz won the Kansas primary.